Yesu asafiwe. Habari. That's about all I know. <laughs> Good morning. That was awesome praise and worship. So give a hand clap to the worship team. I will remind some of you that have never heard me speak, the first five or ten minutes is very painful <laughs> until the anointing comes, amen? Yeah, it's like, you know, God chose me to do the things that I do because it glorifies his name. Let me tell you why, because I get butterflies in my stomach and sweaty palms until the anointing falls. And then I can glorify his name because you can feel the anointing and the presence when he's here. And then I'm able to actually speak his wisdom and his words instead of from my knowledge and my notes. <laughs> but I have my knowledge and my notes because we're, t we're told by the word, right, to be ready in season and out. Amen? So I will refer to my notes till the anointing comes. Hallelujah. Okay. God is good. He is so good. So I have a message. I'm not going to give you the name yet because I'm not going to tell the long testimonies. I'm just going to give you the names of those portions of the testimonies upon my life because God has given many, many, many testimonies upon my life because I did not get born again till I was almost 37 years old. Mm -hmm. I'm 60, I'm going to be 65, I've been practicing saying I am, but I'm going to be in June, 65, so I'm a BB. And in Uganda it's Jaja, and in Yiddish it's Bubby. So you just learn some things, yes. I was raised as a Jew, isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. Yes, so real quickly, I was found under a dead body, and there's scriptures for that, 1 Samuel 2, 8, but we won't go there. Then, again, remember, I'm telling you the really short story because I have a great message, and all of this ties into my great message. Then I was healed supernaturally by a progressive miracle of cancer. Hmm. I did not have an instantaneous healing. Some people get an instantaneous miracle. I had, I call it a miracle in motion. My miracle happened over the course of 14 months. And God gave me a miracle that was empirical. We had proof of it on CAT scans. So God is a big God. He gives us empirical proof at times. Amen? Then the next... The next testimony is God, because when I was first saved and born again, I was a multimillionaire. I am no longer. I've been a multimillionaire a couple of times, though. And what happened, though, is that I found my identity in all those things. They owned me. So God wanted to remove that because he wanted to be the one that was my identity, not all these things. So he had me give away a home. I gave away five cars. I gave away a 10 carat diamond bracelet. I'm, I'm serious, this is very serious. He had me give away all those things. I had to get out of the boat of comfort. So all of these testimonies, I'm short, short things that I'm giving right now, they're each at least a two-hour long story. <laughs> but we don't have 28 hours to tell them, so. And then the next testimony is that I am a survivor of sexual molestation. I was molested from the age of five to the age of 12. And the, the story that I tell is that we can't be silent anymore about these things. 
The Lord has used me to teach children's camps. We did a children's camp in Uganda. We had 500 kids from the age of six to the age of 16 with 50 counselors. And we taught them about, in, in Uganda, they call it bad manners when someone has molested them. That's what they call it. So we spoke openly about that and what to do because we can't be silent in this specific area. Amen? So, because there's a story in the Old Testament about uh, Tamar and Amnon. Are you familiar with that? This was so important to God that he put a story about incest and rape in the Bible. So, again, now that one I can talk about for hours and hours. But we can't get stuck there. Amen? I told you this would be painful. Sorry. And then finally, oh. what must die in your life to be truly redeemed? Right? That's the testimony about my husband committing suicide. So when we talk about what must die in your life to truly be redeemed, the first question that comes is, have you counted the cost? Do you know, everywhere I go, <clears throat> whether it be in the Philippines, Turkey, Nepal, East Africa, Europe, <clears throat> after a workshop or a conference, I have so many young men and women that clamber after me and they say, Impart to me what you have. I want what you have. And you know, I'm not quick to laying on of hands because I will tell them, you don't know what the cost is. You don't know what the cost is. There is sacrifice. There is going beyond obedience, beyond hearing the Holy Spirit, to honoring him. Now I have to say, I was just saying to Bariki on the on the drive here. He's been getting me here safely every day. God bless him. <laughs> I was saying to him that in East Africa, the culture is so different than Western culture. You guys have honor down so well. Whenever I come to East Africa, specifically Tanzania, I feel honored. Hmm. So anyway, I'm, I'm digressing. Let's keep going here. When we talk about what must die to be fully redeemed, much is required. We need to glorify God. Okay, much is required. That's Luke 12, 48. I'm going to read that scripture. But the servant who did things that deserved a beating Without knowing, it will receive a light beating. Much will be required from everyone to whom much has been given. But even more will be demanded from the one to whom much has been entrusted. Right. So I, I have a teaching and a preaching about um, being sent versus being invited. Now, I hate to tell you this, but Pastor and Sia did not actually invite me till I told her about God telling me to come. So he sent me. It's very different when you're sent. Amen? Because it glorifies God, which is Romans 8, 28 through 30. And we are conscious that all things are working together for good to those who have love for God and have been marked out by his purpose. Because those of whom he had knowledge before they came into existence were marked out by him to, make, to be made like his son, so that he might be the first among a band of brothers. And those who were marked out by him were named, and those who were named were given righteousness. And to those to whom he gave righteousness, the same way he gave glory. Amen? 
so. Let's all turn to Isaiah chapter 43, and let's start with verses 18 and, yeah, 18. Say amen when you're there, please. Oh, never mind, it's up there. I forgot. You're so efficient. Is this Rachel again? Yes. Thank you, Rachel. Oh, speaking of honoring, if Hilda's here, I am wearing a katangi she made for me. Isn't it beautiful? Thank you, Hilda. You can tell it fits perfectly. <laughs> I really like this katangi. Thank you. Okay. Back to, you know, we girls, we've got to talk about clothes and sparklies and, you know, I like my sparklies. Yes, even on my toes. Hallelujah. <laughs> my toenails. <laughs> so, do not remember, the, oh, pastor, you just said this. Do not remember the former things nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> in the world... Maybe not here in Tanzania, but in the rest of the world, there's this common phrase. I'm sure you've heard it in the news, or you've heard other people say it. I'm really getting tired of hearing it. But have you heard the phrase, welcome to the new norm because of COVID? Have you heard it? Aren't you tired of it? Yes. <clears throat> this must be good because the enemy's trying to choke me. <clears throat> Hallelujah. You will not have victory over me in the name of Jesus Christ. Okay, here we go. So, how, how often have you heard someone say, this is the new normal? Uh, too often. This is actually a way for the world to say that things have changed and you better get used to the way they are. No, not for us, because we are in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen? We don't have to react, right? We have to act. Amen? From wisdom. I have really struggled with this phrase. I know a lot of other Christians have struggled with this phrase. The new normal. Hmm. This statement of new normal, they're not just saying, welcome to the new. They're saying, this is the way it is, period, end of story. Hmm. I think I have to consider what bothers me more, the phrase, right, or that this is their idea of what it's supposed to be. I think that bothers me more. Doesn't that bother you? Hmm. This is supposed to be our expectation of the way things should be. Uh-uh. No. I'm saying no. Absolutely not. Yes. What would you say your normal was before COVID-19? Hmm? What was it? What's your normal now? So let's say I gave everybody out blank T-shirts with a permanent marker, I like permanent markers, and I said, you have to write on your t-shirt what your normal is. What would it say? What would your t-shirt say? Hmm? Would it say joyful? Would it say grumpy? Would it say sleepy? Would it say frustrated? Would it say fun? Would it say irritable? Fake, passionate, edgy, tired. What would your t-shirt say? Wait a minute, let's take this to a different place. Let's say your children get to write on your t-shirt. What would your child write on your t-shirt? Would it say great, mama? Would it say no time for me? 
Think about this. Hmm. Here's the deal. You don't get to decide what your t-shirt says. Maybe your spouse says what your t-shirt says. Or maybe your boss or your pastor says what your t-shirt says. What would it say? Hmm. Mine would say determined. I know that. Yes. Not stubborn. <laughs> but steadfast. Amen? Hmm. We might have decided what our new normal is, but we do not get to decide the definition of that. The world has done that, right? But we're not going to stick to that norm. So I want to ask a quick question. Do, we, do you even know what your normal really was before COVID-19? Do you remember? What was it? Because it's been, what, a year and a half? Almost two years now, right? No, a year. When was COVID? I'm trying to think. I was stuck in Australia when COVID first hit. So that would have been in February or March of 2020, right? So it's a year, a little over a year. Hmm. Okay. Actually, some people think they'd actually like to have a new normal, right? Uh, maybe not you. Maybe you'd like to have a new normal for someone you know. <laughs> I don't think that I would have said wearing masks was my new normal. You are blessed here in Tanzania. You don't have to wear masks. Everywhere else I have been in East Africa, in Uganda, you have to wear a mask. Mm -hmm. Every time you go into a new place, they spray you with germicide whatever that stuff is called. They spray you. <laughs> they take your temperature. Or you stand in front of the sensor. And every time I stand in front of the sensor, it says it can't read me. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but it can't read me. <laughs> so, what is the title of my message today? New is my normal. That's today's message. We like things that are new. Like we like new cars. No, I don't know about here in Tanzania, but in, in the US, you can actually buy a spray bottle that says new car scent. And you can spray it in your old car so it smells like a new car. <laughs> right? We like new things, right? We like that smell so much. I realize I love the smell of babies, yeah. right? No one has bottled that yet. But maybe it's because sometimes we don't like to smell the diapers. <laughs> but babies, their skin, it just fell, smells so fresh. I don't know how to describe it, but you know what I mean, right? Amen? Yes. <sighs> God has been talking to me about my new normal because we don't get to determine what that normal is. However, we need to embrace the new. Hmm? God is telling me when new is your normal, then you're saying change is my expectation in my life. I'm going to say that again. When new is your normal, then you're saying change is my expectation in my life. How many of you love change? Raise your hand. Wow, there's that many people that love change. That's good. Mm. How many of you really don't love change? Raise your hand. Oh, I think there's a few more of you than that. All right. So only three hands were raised, and Nemes was one of them. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, if you really don't love change, you're going to love this message. I'm being sarcastic. When you say new is my normal, you're saying change is my expectation. You need to get this in your spirit because I'm going somewhere with this. 
There'll be a pop quiz later, by the way. <laughs> we struggle with the idea of new because we struggle with the idea of change. Hmm? Think about that. It's very subtle. Because we're comfortable with what we have, with what we've always done, with our routines. Yeah. What we have is good, right? Mm. But if you've known me long enough, you've heard me either prophesy or say that good is the enemy of God's best. Mm? Yes. So we can't settle for good. Mm. Yes. God did not call you to goodness. He has called every single one of you in here, every single one of you, not just your neighbor, not just the pastor, not just the, pa the, other, the other leaders here. He's called every single one of us to greatness, not goodness. He has called us to greatness in him. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So I might have a little bit different of a preaching style than you're used to. I've often been called the whispering preacher. But I, every once in a while I'll start screaming and shouting. <laughs> Our God is great. Amen? Amen. Our God is great. Come on. Amen. Amen. Where is that? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. We were created in his image and his likeness. Greatness resonates in and through each one of us. Amen. Mm. Remember this. Good is always a compromise. Let that settle in your spirit for a minute. Good is always a compromise. Hmm. <clears throat> Some of you here might be thinking, today would be good if I could just get through it. <laughs> hmm? I've had those days. Uh, Friday was one of those days. It would be good if I could just get through it. Hmm. But God, he brought me through it. If you weren't here Friday night... My daughter is in the hospital. She's still in the hospital, but she's doing better. Praise God. She's uh, been fighting breast cancer for two and a half years. And she went in the, the hospital to have a liter and a half of liquid removed for her, from her lungs. And while she was there, she contracted COVID-19. So they wouldn't let her come home. But praise God, I spoke with her last night, and she's off the ventilator. That's God's greatness. Amen. Hallelujah. New is a challenge because new has the potential of not being great. Because you don't know what new is going to be. Because you haven't been there yet, right? This speaks to our level of faith. It also speaks possibility to supernatural levels of faith as well. Amen. So again, I'm going to I'm going to keep repeating this. When we say that new is my normal, you are saying I am expecting in my life change on a regular basis. Ooh. That's a hard one. That's a hard pill to swallow. New is walking from glory to glory in each new moment. But to go from glory to glory, you've got to change. Because if you're moving from glory to glory, you can't be the same person you were to experience that new level of glory. So that means you have to change. Hmm. That has to be the expectation of this was good, but it's going to be even better when you think of new. We're not supposed to just stay there in the good. This is our mindset, right? <clears throat> the problem is, if we're afraid of new, if we're afraid of change, let's interchange those words, right? If you're afraid of new or you're afraid of change, it really means you're stuck. Hmm? 
Hmm. It means we've stopped growing. We've stopped developing. Hmm. But get this. God says he makes all, not some things, all things new. That's what the Bible says, right? Amen. What does he make new? Amen. He makes all things new. All things. This moment, the next moment, the next moment, all things new. Amen? The thing is that when we think of new, we don't think that it's constant. So, now this is where I'm tying my little testimonies. If you noticed, every one of my testimonies were different, right? I was found under a dead body. God kept me from the hideousness and horrendousness and saved me from being molested. He healed me of cancer. So you notice, they were all different things. They were changes. They were new testimonies. They were different testimonies. That's why I've got so many testimonies, because they were new. They were different from each other. Amen? We think of new as something we achieve, but the moment we have that achievement, it's no longer new. Like when we say, I have a new job. Well, the minute you enter that door for the new job, it's no longer new. The minute you buy that brand new car and you drive it off the lot, it is no longer new. As a matter of fact, it usually loses in a brand new car. If it's a $60,000 car, it automatically loses twenty grand. Automatically, just driving it off the lot. So it's no longer considered new. Hmm? Right? Hmm. Maybe some of you want a new relationship. Hmm? But you know what? Having that new relationship isn't going to change you. It's only going to change your circumstances. Hmm. Think about that. Hmm? I think I've told you a couple of times that when I'm in the States, I do a lot of inner healing or counseling. I do a lot of marital counseling for different leaders. And, you know, they'll come in. Of course, you guys know you have the secret. You have the tool now from yesterday about Ephesians 5.33, right? Love and respect. Well, before I get a chance to teach that with, in couples and marriage counseling, a lot of them will come in. Well, you know, if we just, maybe it's time to have another baby. Our marriage would be different. Or if we just would move to... New York, our marriage would be different. Or maybe it's time to get divorced. So you hear that a lot, actually. And then my life would be different. But the sad truth, but it is a truth, is that you're only talking about changing your circumstance. You are not talking about changing yourself. How do we change ourselves? We must surrender to the Holy Spirit. Hmm? He can bring about that change when we surrender. Only he can, but you have to say yes. Amen? He can use you, but you have to say yes. He can glorify you, but you have to say yes. He can redeem you, but you have to say yes. He's not going to give you what you don't think you need. Isn't that what I taught you yesterday? He will not give you what you don't think you need. He will not give you what you will not acknowledge that you need. Can you acknowledge? Hey, I was a codependent, controlling, manipulative woman before God got a hold of me. I was. I still have to fight that evil, demonic, generational 
junk from time to time because it's easy to fall back there if we're not on guard. But you see now, if you've signed up for those documents, you have tools that you can refer back to. You have tools now that can keep you in a level of the ability of having victory from glory to glory to glory, which is from new to change to new to change to new. Hmm. This just changes their circumstances when they want a new baby, a new car, a new house, a new address, right? And they will find and they have found that they only bring their problems with them into the new circumstance, right? So many times we think the new is going to fix the old. That's one of those subtle lies of the enemy, isn't it? Hmm? The danger of new is that you think new has to be different. Let me give you a good example. I'm going to pick on Pastor Ansia. The last time I saw her beautiful children was almost two years ago, right? They were smaller, right? A little bit shyer. But now they've grown, right? And they're not quite as shy. <laughs> now here's the thing. They're new, their growth, they've grown, they've changed, right? So that's new, but they're not different. They're not different children, but they're different. They're new, they've grown. This is an example of what I mean, that new isn't necessarily different. Hmm. Yeah. Think about that. It's your children. They change. I have my daughter, Irina. She's 40, going to be 43, I think, for a minute. <laughs> she's going to be 43, <clears throat> but she's the same person when we adopted her at 12. She's the same Irina, but she's grown. So she's different. She's new each stage of her growth, but she's not a different person. She's the same Irina, right? But yet she will say, Mom, I'm a mom now. I'm 43 years old, 42 years old. I'm not the 12-year-old. No, she's not. But the substance of who she are is, is the same. She's not a new daughter. She's the same daughter. Amen? So <clears throat> that's my way of explaining that the danger of new is that we think it has to be different. And when we think that it has to be different, that means we're afraid to grow. Think about that. New requires growth. Different doesn't. I'm going to say that again. New requires growth. Different doesn't. Because new, N-E-W, puts responsibility on ourselves. Mm -hmm. Different doesn't require commitment to growth. I think sometimes we say we want something new, but what we really want is something different. Hmm? A lot of times we throw away the new thing because we want something different. A lot of times we don't even see the new thing because we see it every day. When your new is your normal and it's happening constantly, sometimes we discredit what God is doing in our lives because we're looking for something different, not new, right? Hmm, All right. Sometimes we want God to do something new in our relationship, but what we really want is for God to do something different. Hmm? So we interchange new with different, but they don't mean the same thing. 
The word of God didn't say I would make all things different. He's, the word of God says, I will make all things new. All. All. Mm, he doesn't say different. So think about the new year. Now I know, especially after talking with Bariki, that the new year is, is celebrated a little bit differently in Tanzania than maybe other countries. But, you know, maybe you do have the same thing that we will, will practice. We'll say, out with the old. Do you say that? In with the new. Mm. But what are we really saying? Out with the old, in with new change, right? Something different. Okay, do not misbehave. Okay, thank you. And a lot of times we just want a different opportunity or we want a different experience. Mm. We don't really want the new because that means we have to be committed to change, to growth, right? But we don't always want the responsibility of that change or growth. But think about it. Many of you as parents have taken on the responsibility of change and growth. That's new. New requires commitment. New requires you to stay the course. I have abandoned some really awesome God moments because I didn't want something new. I wanted something different. I thought, well, he did this move before. It needs to be new, but I didn't want new. I wanted different. I didn't want to fall out in the spirit and drool on the floor. That's what happens to me sometimes. I do. I fall out in the spirit and then I drop. Someone actually videoed me. I was so embarrassed. <laughs> so I wanted something new, but really what I wanted was something different. Because I was so vain, I didn't want to be caught drooling on the floor in the spirit. Hmm? I missed out on a lot of God opportunities. But I don't think we should start this year looking for different. Of course, we're now at April, almost in May. How many of you are looking for different? Hmm? Hmm. The new that God is doing in you can catch you off guard because it's not defined by your circumstances or situation. It's going to catch you off guard because it will look the same today. It's really shocking when God does something new, but it looks familiar to what he's already done. But yet today, today it suddenly has power. Hmm? The danger of the scripture. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? Shall you not know it? That means, can you not perceive it? Or it actually means, don't miss it. That means you can possibly miss it. Don't miss it. How many new things that God has sprung forth have we missed? Because we were looking for something different. This is really deep, believe it or not. <laughs> and yet it's simple. When the word tells you not to miss it, that means there's an opportunity to miss it. We can miss it because it doesn't look like what we thought it should look like. We had an unspoken expectation. We had an unspoken thought of what we thought that would look like. I'll use a good example. Um, I won't use their names. The other night, I was asked to go to some people's houses. Now, they didn't know I was coming, and I didn't know they weren't expecting me. <laughs> right? 
and but God had a plan and who none of us knew that this is what it was going to look like when it was unfolding, right? But when it was unfolding, we knew that God was there, right? These, these people were very gracious. They weren't expecting me. I, I thought they knew I was coming, but they were gracious and they received me. Hallelujah. But all their expectation, if they knew I was coming, I, I could be wrong, so forgive me if I'm wrong, but if they knew I was coming, they might have been prepared. They might have gotten all dressed up and gussied up, and maybe they would have prepared a little snack and some tea, and they would have been prepared. But God had a different plan. He didn't want us to eat. <laughs> he wanted us to hear. He wanted to minister to us expectation of what a new situation is supposed to be. Uh-uh. No. You know, my pastor, my senior pastor, who is now retired, his name is Francis Enfuso. He and his wife are still very dear friends of mine. He was my greatest champion in the United States. He still is. He had this thing that he would say, very deep, but he'd say, any expectation outside of God is sin. Think about that. If your expectation is not inside of God, it is sin. How many unspoken expectations do we have in our marriage? How many unspoken expectations do we have of our parents? Or greater yet, if you're a parent or a BB like me, how many unspoken expectations do we have in our children or our grandchildren? Like, they're supposed to be good and quiet and, and well-behaved. <laughs> but you know, here's the thing. <clears throat> If all our children were good and quiet and well-behaved, they'd all fit in a box. Hmm? Right? I have found that God's future leaders are usually the porcupines when they're little. <laughs> they're the ones that can screech the loudest. Oh, my ears. Right? Or that want your attention because they have something to share. That means that they are leaders, right? Don't put your children in this box of expectation, amen? Or your relationships. Mm -mm. So we can really miss it because it doesn't look like what we thought new should look like, right? So th this is the part of the scripture. I will even the road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. God is saying, I'm reviving these desert places. You know when you're looking for different, you're not looking for the desert to become an oasis. You have to look for you to take the oasis to the desert. That's the kingdom mindset. The kingdom mindset says, Taking the kingdom with you. Not being in the middle of the desert and expecting God to save you from that desert or to suddenly bring the oasis to you. No. You are all great. Remember, we started that out earlier. You are greatness in him. And that greatness in him when we model that, when we walk that greatness out, means that we bring the kingdom of God to our desert place so that others can experience the rivers of living water. Amen? Waters. Because this is waters. Pour out the living waters. If you're looking for the oasis instead of bringing it, you're going to miss what God is doing. You can miss the growth, that first new sprout of the green that comes up. You can totally miss it if you're looking for different. Hmm? 
when you're in the desert place and you get to see that little tiny bit of green pop when everything else around you is brown, right? If you miss it, you're going to walk right over it. Or you might even trample it and kill it. I've done that. Not intentionally, but because I was looking for something different and not receiving the new that God had for me, I killed it. I killed it. I trampled all... Or if you're speaking something out of authenticity, they know. Like, you know I really am a sinner, right? Because I've told you that. You know I really am a sinner. Because I've spoken out of my authenticity, right? We must walk as leaders from a place of authenticity. Amen? Amen. Amen. I used to, thank God I'm delivered of that, I used to wear a perfect face of makeup. Now I hardly ever wear it. Um, I do wear lipstick, by the way, but... <laughs> I used to wear, actually, a pound of makeup, you know, ten necklaces, at least five bracelets, and a ring on each finger before I'd go out. And, of course, I had nail polish on, and you can see, I've really been delivered. I don't even have nail polish on my hands anymore. Because I felt that was what perfect was. But really, all it was was fake. Now, it's okay. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with wearing makeup, because I do wear makeup sometimes, you know? But my expectation was that's the only way I could be. But God, he loves us just the way we are. Amen? Amen? He loves us in our beautiful moments, but he also loves us in our difficult moments. He accepts us just the way we are. Thank goodness. And thank goodness I am not God, because I would judge myself and everybody else. Well, I used to. I've been delivered. I've been redeemed. Amen? You could miss that little new sprout of growth if you've trampled all over it, if you're looking to where you're going to go to next instead of looking at the new. So think about that. If you've been in a conversation and you've been in a really deep conversation and all you can think about is, I need to make my point, I need to make my point, I need to make my point, and I'm going to tell them blah, 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 blah. Right? Right? then you miss the whole point of the conversation because you're only thinking about your point. Yes. Right? right? Did you hear? Did you actually hear what the other person was saying? I don't know about you, but I've done that. I need to make my point. It's so good. It's so good. Then I miss the amazing point that that other person made. Right? God uses other people to speak to us sometimes. Yes. Oh, boy. God has used four-year-olds to speak to me. He has. One of the things I've learned is that the word of God is true. Because if the word of God can use a donkey, to, Balaam's donkey, right, to speak to a man, why can't he use children? Out of the mouths of babes, I'll tell you what, some of the greatest wisdom has come forth. And you think about it and go, where did that come from? Amen? 
God. It came from him. It came from him. Sorry, I keep moving around. You can't for the camera, man. I apologize. But I like to move around. Okay. And God will be saying, what are you doing? What are you doing? He didn't say, behold, I'm doing something new. I'm going to transport you to that oasis. He didn't say that. He said, behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Think about that scripture. He didn't say, behold, I'm going to bring you to your oasis when you're in the middle of the desert. No, no. Behold, I will do a new thing. Get the next word is now. Now. N-O-W in case you can't spell it. Now I will do a new thing. Hmm? Now it shall spring forth. Sorry. Now it shall spring forth. If you're not looking for it and you're looking for the next, you will miss it. Because the next scripture is, shall you not know it? So God is actually saying, why don't you see it? Shall you not know it? Why don't you see it? Because you're thinking about, oh, I need to fix my hair. Oh, I need the best outfit. You know, I have to have the greatest katangi. I do have the greatest katangi, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not my focus, right? My focus is, what's the new thing God is going to do? One of my favorite saying is, expect the unexpected. Hmm? How many times have you heard me say that? Expect the unexpected. That's the new thing. You don't see it because you're not looking for it. The scripture says, I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Oh God, you're going to take me to the desert? <laughs> That's what I heard. He's taking me to the desert. You mean I'm staying in the wilderness? Ugh. Yes, he does mean that. Because what God has called us to He's called us to transform the world around us. He's called us to do that. He's doing that through us. Are you transforming your world? Hmm. Or are you waiting to be saved? Are you waiting for the oasis to be brought to you? Hmm. Hmm. And Jesus says that I'm the kind of savior that says, now establish my kingdom right where you are. Not tomorrow. Not when I'm at this great church. He's saying, now establish the kingdom of God right where you are. Hmm. Are you establishing the kingdom of God in your home? Hmm. Are you establishing the kingdom of God in your community? Hmm. Are you establishing the kingdom of God in your church? Hmm. Yes, you have amazing worship here. I have to say that. You have amazing worship. And, and, are you exhibiting the unconditional love of God to new visitors here. That's the kingdom of God. Hmm? We really just want a savior who saves us, huh? He does save us. But usually he saves us from ourselves, not from a situation. We have to make the choice. We have to make the choice. We have to use our free will. I 
I'm sure there's nobody in this room that has any challenges in their relationships, right? I'm the only one, right? No. <laughs> For those relationships to change, it doesn't mean they have to change the other person. It means you have to change. You have to grow. You have to be submitted to the Holy Spirit's redemption. You have to surrender to what God wants to do in you. Don't worry about what God is going to do in them. See, when you point your finger, you've got three fingers pointing back at yourself, right? Hmm. Yes. Change me, oh God. Open the book of every area that needs to be changed. Hmm? Because I want a new thing. Hallelujah. We often say, God save me. But what Jesus actually says is, you are here yourself to reestablish what true relationship is and what true relationship looks like. You. You. You are here to reestablish what that is. The best place to start is by exhibiting the amazing, unconditional love of Jesus Christ. That's the best place to start. Amen? Hallelujah? Okay. I don't hear a ton of amens. Amen. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I need that word of affirmation when I'm preaching. Thank you very much. <laughs> hmm. And God says, this is what streams in the desert looks like. He says, I'm going to do something new. And I just, in the past, have often thought, can he just give me something different? I don't want to be in the wilderness anymore. I was in the wilderness for seven years. Seven years. <sighs> Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. I got the revelation about the kingdom that we bring the transformation through him using us. Amen? Amen. <sighs> Isaiah 43, 18. Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. It's really tough, because I think about, God did a super miraculous miracle in my life and healed me of cancer. But that's a thing of old, isn't it? God saved me from being under a dead body. I share that testimony, but I can't stay camped there because that's old. Hmm? That's old. For some of us, it's so hard to look at the new when all you do is look at the past, right? Isn't that what the Israelites did? They were looking back at Egypt saying, oh, I remember those green onions and potatoes. Oh, God, they were so good. And here we are. We have to eat this manna. Ooh, we have to. Can you imagine if we got to get up every day and pick fresh manna? That'd be amazing. But they wanted the green onions because they were stuck in the past. They were missing the manna. If we were there, we'd give us the manna. We don't care about the green onions. We want the manna, right? That's an example. It's an example of missing the new. Hmm? And I'm not just talking about, you know, we don't have to just forget the bad things. It's also about the good things. Because those past good things can hold you back. Yeah. Hmm? Right? I had a friend of mine who, whenever you saw him, he always talked about the mighty move of God in Toronto at the Toronto Blessing. Right? This man was an amazing man. He was so prophetic. Everything that poured out of his mouth was like, it was prophetic, and he didn't even know it because he was so stuck on this amazing move of God. And I'm not saying that God didn't move then. He did. But he was stuck there. 
and said, that, the Toronto blessing was it. It was it. It was it. He couldn't see that God was using him now outside of the Toronto blessing. Yeah, it was pretty cool. It was pretty funny. There was a lot of laughing. There's a lot of other weird stuff too, though, I'll tell you. People crawling around on their knees, oinking like pigs and barking like dogs. I'm glad I'm not there anymore. <laughs> they were. <laughs> I thought it was a manifestation of the demonic. A lot of other people thought it was a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. And I said, get delivered. <laughs> But again, this is the point. He was stuck. He couldn't see how God could use him now. Now I shall pour out rivers of living waters. Amen? He was really, he's amazing today. I, I pray for him because he's an amazing prophet. An amazing prophet. I know sometimes those former things were pretty great. But you know what? What God has for you today, today, today is even greater. Amen? It's greater than yesterday. Hallelujah. See, Pastor and see you. You spoke this scripture earlier. Well, somebody's saying it. I'm sorry. But I think you said something about that. But anyway, yes. So, you guys, you're on the right page. Amen? Don't consider the former things. Do not look back at yesterday. Yesterday cannot change your tomorrow. Mm-mm. But you can change today. You can recognize the new thing that God is doing, even if it's not different. Amen? Amen. God's not just the God of yesterday and tomorrow. He's the God of today. The God of now. Amen? Because he wants you Every one of us, you, us, me, right? He wants us to walk in victory today. Not when you've got it all perfect. Not when you do A, B, C, D, and E that you think you should do. He wants you to have victory now. Now. Now I shall pour out. Livers, rivers of living water. Livers. <laughs> rivers of living water. Today is an important day because today is the day that you have. Amen. Today is an important day because today is the day that you have. Amen? We have to stop looking back. And we need to stop looking back with regret. If you missed it yesterday, God forgive me for missing it. It's that simple. Remember, he forgives as far as the east is from the west. He forgives. Get over yourself. Oh, no. Oh, no. Everyone used to say, this is before I've been a little more redeemed, Everyone used to say that my ministry was suck it up ministries. <laughs> I did. I'd say, get over yourself. Suck it up. <laughs> Grow up. I didn't tell people how. But God, but God, but God, he redeemed me. He was doing something new in me that wasn't necessarily different, but now I can see it was something new. New, because I'm no longer saying suck it up. I don't think. Do you hear that come out of my mouth now? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I don't say grow up. I want to sometimes. Not here. Not you guys. Just in America. 
Regret ties you to your past. Hmm? I get this one. Fear paralyzes your future. I'm going to say that again. Fear paralyzes your future. Stop looking back. Stop considering and living in a place of regret because it turns into an anchor. It turns into bondage that holds you back. This day, this day, today is a new day. It is a new day. It doesn't matter what happened yesterday. What's happening today? If you're so involved with looking at what greatness happened yesterday, you're going to miss the new that God wants to do now. Now. Now I shall spring forth rivers of living water. Oh, good, I didn't say livers. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. You can be filled with God and still be living with regret and fear. Hmm. If you have frustration or disappointment each day, that means you have regret or fear or both. So remember, we, you, we are filled with the goodness and greatness of God. Amen? Amen. We're filled with all kinds of possibilities. Because what does this word say? It says, we can do what? All things. Oh, there's that word again, all. Not some. All things in Christ Jesus, right? He makes some. <gasps> he makes all things new. Yes. Thank you, Father. Hmm. We are filled with all sorts of potential, and yet sometimes we're going nowhere because we're angry or we're frustrated or we're filled with regret or disappointment, and we're just spinning our wheels. What do we do when we're filled with that anger, that frustration, and that disappointment? We usually blame other people. Or we blame our circumstance. But we don't take on the responsibility of why we got here in the first place. We don't own it. We have to acknowledge and we have to own our part so that God can redeem us. Constantly, every day, sometimes several times a day, he gives you a new invitation of redemption for that area or a new area or a different area in your life. Every day. The invitation of redemption isn't just salvation. The invitation of redemption is to get beyond your stubbornness and become steadfast. Right? The invitation of redemption is to get beyond your fear and walk in God's perfect love. The invitation of redemption is to say no to depression. The invitation of redemption, it's every day, sometimes moment by moment, he's giving you a new invitation of redemption. It's your choice to say yes. You've got to say yes. I thought I had to wait till I was perfect. If we had to wait till I was perfect, we'd have to wait till I was dead. I believed a lie. The enemy wanted to keep me paralyzed from the goodness and the fullness of all that God wanted me to walk in because I had this unspoken expectation. I needed to be perfect. That's a lie. You don't need to be perfect. You do not need to be perfect. God can use you just the way you are now. You can bring those rivers of living waters with you now. You can pour out the rivers of living water now. What are you waiting for? Don't be like me and become a jaja and then the waters run out. That's what happened to me. I was waiting to be perfect. 
I was waiting for God to make me perfect instead of do my part. But he woke me up. You know, you've, I've told you, I kind of have a hard head. He had to hit me upside the head with a two by four. He says, I'm not going to make you perfect. I can give you the redemption to do it, but you've got to choose it. Say yes. Say yes. What have you been saying no to? Not necessarily with your mouth, but with your actions. What have you been saying no to? What? Or what have you been saying yes to? Fear. Apathy. Contention. Strife. Lawlessness even. We ought to say no to those things. God gave you free will. Use this amazing gift. He gave us free will. But we must use our free will to bring the kingdom of God, to transform the places of life, community, family, home, marriage, relationship. Right? Amen? Hallelujah? Okay, I've lost my place now. That's okay. I thought that was good. <laughs> Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Hallelujah. But you have to come into agreement with him. Remember, this is what I've been saying all along. The only person that can change you is you. God can help bring that change, but you have to say yes. You have to say yes. You have to come into agreement with him. And I say, but God, I want you to do it. You can do it for me. One time, this is terrible, but you know, it's truth. One time I was feeling sorry for myself and I was just having a pity party and goes, God, take this from me. And he said, well, you know, if you really want me to take this from you, I can do what I did to Ananias and Sapphira. Yeah. <laughs> he did. He said that. I felt like that was a really soft rebuke because he didn't say he would do it. He says, if you really want me to. It's like, ooh, that's really heavy. Okay. No. I will strive for excellence here on earth. Amen. Yes. Perfection can only be reached when we're seated at the right hand of the throne of the Heavenly Father. That is where perfection can be reached. It cannot be reached here on earth. Perfection is bondage here on earth. Are you getting me? Are you hearing me? Perfection is bondage. Ooh. But God, he says, stop striving for perfection. You will get to that place once you're in the heavenlies. He says, strive for my excellence. 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 Excellence is different from one person to another. Excellence is different for you because you like to do everything. Right? <laughs> Excellence is different for you. Excellence is different for me and Pastor and Zia and my dear daughter Nema, spiritual daughter. Excellence is different for each one of us. I was so stuck in the bondage of perfection. Okay, don't laugh too much. I used to have to clean my house before the cleaning lady would come. Real story, real truth. I did. And you know what else? I would go around my house with white gloves, and if that white glove got any dirt on it, I would clean it before she came. Or I'd take a toothpick or Q-tips. You know what Q-tips are, right? Yeah, earbuds. I would take those in all the cracks and see, okay, is there dirt there? Uh, <laughs> Yes, I was OCD. That's perfection in bondage. Yes, I would do that before the cleaning lady would come. So what did she, do? <laughs> what did she, do? 
She ironed a lot of my clothes. <laughs> but God forbid I should have a filthy house. You know, I was such in bondage to perfection that you couldn't even enter my house unless I could go with the white glove and go, okay, it's okay, they can come in. I've been delivered of that. Now you can actually see a half an inch of dust. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You can actually see dust in my house now. That's deliverance. I'm telling you, that's deliverance. I'm no longer OCD. That's deliverance. Because he gives us an invitation of redemption every day. He gives us a new invitation if we would but hear. You know, sometimes we're so busy giving God our list of things that we want or desire or need that we can't hear him. Hmm? And when we don't hear him, we miss the new that he's doing. Amen? Yes, it's good to pray. Yes, it says to petition. But there's also times of just waiting on him and listening. Listening. I used to, when I was first born again, well, even beyond being first born again, um, I would pray for six hours. Things would just come out of my mouth. A lot of times I'd pray in tongues. But I was never quiet to hear him. I was too busy telling him what I needed instead of, what would you have me do this day, God? What is your will today? So today is a new day. Today is a new day. Hmm. We're almost finished. I said earlier, but I wanted God to do it. And his response was, it's already done. But you didn't say yes. Now, we not only need to say yes, but we need to agree with him. It's tough talking about new. You know what the good news is? His mercies are new every morning. His mercies are new every morning. Amen? Hallelujah. His grace is new. His love is new. His peace is new. His joy is new. Hallelujah. Wow. So new actually does need to become our new normal. But in him. In him. Right? In him. We need to keep changing. We need to keep saying yes to growth. Saying yes to change. So that he can use us. So that we can be his vessel to bring transformation. To bring the rivers of living water to those that don't have it. You're leaders. Every one of you here, you are leaders. God saved you. He saved you for your salvation. But now he wants you to bring the rivers of living waters. He wants you to bring transformation to your community, to your family, to your church, to your city, to your nation to East Africa, to the continent of Africa, or maybe all around the world. Rivers of living water. <laughs> yeah. Supernatural transformation. God is saying, stop trying to get saved from the wilderness. Stop trying to get saved from the desert place and start bringing him to it. 
your current desert place, it, it might be your marriage, it might be your job, it might be your family. Whether you're teaching or doing politics, who knows? But, you know, here's the thing. When you're in the wilderness, you feel alone. But you're not alone. And I'm not just talking about the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ and God the Father. Yes, he's a part of us. And you need to know you're not alone. I used to think that I was the only survivor of sexual molestation for the longest time till I started doing stats, statistics. It says one in four children have been molested. This is a global stat. One in four. And those are only the reported ones. Mine was never reported. So let's go suicide. You know, with suicide, suicide is the number one killer globally. Now, why did I go there? <laughs> I went there for a reason, or God wanted me to go there. But you know, we can't accept the stats. Amen? We can't. Oh, because you think you're alone. That's why I went there. If you know someone who's been suicidal, or who's attempted suicide even, or maybe you've even thought about it, maybe you didn't do it, but maybe you've thought about it, right? You're not alone. If you've been molested, you're not alone. I guarantee you there's at least three other people in the room that have experienced what you've experienced. And here's the beauty. There's a scripture that says, it's by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony that we overcome and we love not our own lives even unto death. So you know what I get out of that scripture? When I share my testimony, I give someone else hope because God brought me through. Jesus Christ brought me through. Share your testimony. It's going to bring help and hope to someone else. And they're going to say, wow, if she could come through it, maybe I could. Or if he could come through it, oh, maybe I could. But God. But God. Amen? Mm. The other thing that you need to keep in mind, that the thing that God has called you to isn't what the person sitting next to you is called to. Don't covet what they're called to. You don't know what the price is for what they're called to. Think about that. But God... He calls us to different places in him. If you've been wandering in the wilderness, he wants to make a way in the wilderness through you. You just need to agree with him, and he can set you free. But you've got to say yes. Amen? Step out of the old and step into the new. Okay? Step out of the old and step into the new. That step is an act of faith. That step, that step is your yes. Amen? Amen? New requires you to commit to growth. Stop asking God to save you from your desert place. Bring God to your desert place. Because God wants new to be our normal. Amen? Hallelujah. On that note... Can I do a quick altar call? On that note, I want to ask anyone that is stuck looking at the past, saying, oh, 
the Toronto blessing was so great. That conference last month was so great. If you're stuck there, I want you to come forward. If you're having a difficult time saying yes to the new, or if you believe after listening to today's preaching that you've trampled, trampled, <laughs> trampled all over the new accidentally, come forward because God is saying, I can redeem that. I can redeem your accidents. I can redeem your past when you say yes. I can redeem your past when you say, I missed it, God. I missed it, but I don't want to keep missing it. I want to bring the fullness of the kingdom of God here with me now so that now rivers of living water can pour forth and refresh others now.